There's a dance that's in your chair You've given us the bed Now we're stirring up the head Bring the rain I heard the voice I heard the voice of a prophet of our time He said there's revival if you want to believe for it. And you see the people of God just play God's power. Can you believe it? Can you receive it? There'll be peace and happy, happiness, a place of love for everyone. And we'll be one great big family. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Those are the words. Those are the words of a guy called Ishmael. I named my son after him. Some of you know Ian Smale, who's a Pentecostal pastor. And he did a great work with children. And he wrote those words some uh, 30 years ago, maybe. I hear the voice of a prophet of our time. He said, There's revival. If you want to receive it. And I believe that we're in an era where that might have been written 30 years ago, but it's bang up to date for today. What God is laying on our hearts, the reality of the Holy Spirit laying on our hearts that He wants a revival. The beautiful verse in Habakkuk will come up on the screen maybe if the, if the electrics work. I'm, not, I'm old school, I am. <laughs> Let me read it to you. Beautiful. Habakkuk 2, verse 3. This vision is for a future time. It, it describes the end. And it will be fulfilled. If it's slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. Amen. Later on he says, it's incredible that further down the page he says, for as the waters fill the sea, the earth will be filled with an awareness of the glory of God. You turn to Joel, it's in Joel he says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Now either that's a lie Either that is just something that is in the Bible and is never going to take place, or it is the truth. If the Bible says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, it means it. The God is a vision. We've already heard the spirit of God speaking through those films just now. It's a vision. God is raising up an army of people who have one heart, and it's a heart to see the Holy Spirit poured out throughout the whole world. Can you receive it? Is that your passion? There's a guy called uh, Selwood Hughes. My mum used to have his teaching notes, every day with Jesus, teaching notes. Came from South Wales, very humble man. He, he started an organisation, you know what he called his organisation? Crusade for World Revival. What a great name for an organization. He had the same heart of God, for love for the world, every country, crusade for world revival. God is putting a hunger in the church of Great Britain right now. Us lot, ordinary people of the engine house, to get the passion of God for revival all over the world. You hear the prayers that have been prayed this morning. Feel the spirit, what he's engendering with us. The excitement. Isn't it good to be alive yeah, in 2019? Yeah, yeah. To be part of what God is saying. Yeah. I make no apology. You're going to hear a preach that you heard last week. I don't care. If God's saying it to the church, let's listen to what the spirit is saying to the church. Hallelujah. God is, God is putting a hunger in my heart. 
Can you hear the heart of Tibor when he prays? I love listening to people pray. I hear God when people pray. I hear God speaking to me. And what God does, I can only... He starts off with a passion. We've heard it already. He starts off with prayer warriors. Before he pours out his spirit, he starts off with people praying, hungry for the Holy Spirit to be outpoured. Starts every revival that's ever happened throughout the world to start off with people praying. We've already seen it on the, on the film. Yeah. And that's us, guys. Your, God is putting the Spirit of God in our hearts so we capture that passion that comes from God himself. I got baptised in the Spirit on my motorbike. <laughs> <laughs> I got brought up in Baptist Ality, wonderful upbringing, steeped in the Word of God. And when I got to about 17, I, I had that phrase which encapsulated in a worship song. There must be more than this. You know that, that song? Yeah. Yeah. I, somebody put it into words so, so much more beautiful. And that was me. I, I was thinking, well, singing a hymn, we're sitting down, standing up, singing a hymn, listening to a preach, sitting down, singing a hymn. There must be more than this. Now, I didn't even know what I wanted. I just knew that there must be. If Jesus is supposed to be alive today, there must be. There must be. Can't be poor it exists. You see the preparation? Preparation. Preparation. God is preparing our hearts. Yeah, that's right. It's hungry. Yeah. I went along to a Assemblies of God church in South Ockendon or somewhere, or Avery or somewhere in Essex. Ah, man, it was rocking. It was rocking. The Spirit of God was there, and the preachers that pointed, pointed to somebody here with neck trouble and back trouble and all sorts of troubles physically. And he, he pointed to, he, to a point around, he said, there's a young man here who's a Christian already, but he's searching for God. I knew he was talking to me. I put my hand up. God prayed for me. He's probably in heaven now. I hope you're listening, because he never knew what actually happened. When I left the church and sat on my motorbike, the presence of God came down on me. I have told thousands and thousands and thousands of people that the presence of God came down. That's my testimony. When God touched me, but why did he touch me? He touched me because I was hungry. He puts a hunger in our hearts because he wants to produce the effect. And there's a statement I want to say to you. But even if you forget everything I've said today, please, please listen to this statement. I think it's from God. As much as I know God, I think it's from God. The statement is this, that God throughout history has used people that want him. So simple. Throughout history, God, the people that God has decided to use is the people that actually want him. Does that make sense? God wants you to want him with all your heart. There's a guy called John Wimber. John Wimber blessed this country, or Lord used him to bless this country. And I went to Acts 86 in the NEC. It was like a big meeting, thousands and thousands of people. And John had a great way about him. He just sort of like, he just said, come on, we're just going to wait for the Holy Spirit. I wait for the Holy Spirit. And then, and then like a wave of the Holy Spirit, people like start shouting out, screaming, and all sorts of good stuff. I've never seen anything like it. The presence of God was there. And he was so relaxed, he said, he's almost chewing gum. He's saying, any, anybody used for healing? No, anybody here never been used for healing? Well, you stand over here. Anybody need healing? Or oh, well, you stand over there. i tell you what, look. You've never been used for healing? Right, you go and pray for that person. And you tell a few jokes while the guy was being prayed for. He was so laid back because he's aware of the Holy Spirit. And he wrote a song, I think he wrote it anyway, it used to be a song that was sang during that meeting a lot. And the song had this refrain, and I will prepare him my heart. 
And that beautiful words for a song, I will prepare him my heart. And I, 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 I believe that's what God is doing amongst us. He's preparing us, our hearts, because he wants to be at home, at home in our hearts. And there's a hunger that's starting to develop within us for the Holy Spirit to move. Yeah. And it's beautiful. Blessed are those who hunger <coughs> and thirst after righteousness. And it all happens in the time of prayer. When we walk up and down, praying. That's where the power starts generating. That's where the, where the passion starts generating. You know, I've found that my prayer life is where I get my strength. If I don't pray, I'm so weak. Yeah. But when I pray, God starts to put a strength in me. Yeah. And my spirit becomes focused. Yeah, that's right. you know, there's a beautiful bit in, 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 in Numbers where it, it talks about the children of Israel. And they, they, kind of, they want their religious ways. They want the same old, the same old. They're happy with the same old, the same old. <coughs> And they send the spies in, don't they? Twelve spies go in. And the spies come back and they say, well, there's, there's big grapes and there's all sorts of blessings. It's great. And some of the spies say, well, yeah, but there's giants there. And there's a beautiful verse amongst this background of fear. There's a beautiful verse where it says about Caleb. But Caleb was of a different spirit. I want that dif different spirit. I want to be inflamed by God's heart. So one of the things I've, I've, I believe is that sometimes you go to pray and, and, it, and it kind of, is, it, is this real? You ever get that where you start praying and you start off like a traction engine? Is it really real? Is God real? Are we here for actual purpose? And as I walk up and down, I start building my faith up. And God starts to speak to me. There's two people, I want to read you this. It's a bit of a passage, but I want to read it to you. It's in Luke 2, it's beautiful. It says this. At that time there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout. I was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to them he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the Lord required, Simeon was there. He took the child, it's a beautiful picture, isn't it? He took the child in his arms and he praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace, as you have promised. I can die now. I've seen what I've been praying for all these years. I've seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. His light to reveal God to the nations. And he is the glory of your people, Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. And Simeon blessed them. And he said to Mary, the baby's mother, this, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall. But he will be a joy to many others. It's been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. He prophesies about this kid. But what's great, it's fallen on by another lady, an old lady. Please, if you're 84, this applies to you. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there night and day, worshipping God with fasting and prayer. Doesn't that sound like the prayer room? She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began facing God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. That's fantastic. He had two people... Who, 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 who pray and keep praying. Night after night, day after day after day. Did they always feel the presence of God? Did they always feel those gooey feelings when the Holy Spirit comes on you? No, they didn't. They just kept on praying. 
It's not about feelings. Sometimes we can worship our feelings of the Holy Spirit. No, it's actually being focused. Focused. Now, I remember carrying the cross once in Bulgaria, and they told me that there was going to be water at a petrol station uh, on my route. I don't know what happened in translation, got lost in translation. There was no water, there was no petrol station. And I knew what it was like to feel absolutely addicted to water. The only thing I could think about was water. I would have spent 50 pounds for a glass of water. I ended up drink, drinking a whole load of dirty water because from some gypsies who gave me a bottle of water. You know, I was absolutely a drug addict, if you like, for water. I was focused. God wants me to be focused like that for God. So all I can think of, I've got a one-track mind. I want to know Jesus. Jesus said, he said, beautiful words, he said, he said, this is eternal life, know the one true God and Jesus Christ, his son. And you know the word he uses for knowing? It's the word called yada, I think it is in, in Hebrew. That, that's actually the word for, for, for sexual in, intimacy. And, uh, I, you know, I, I call, I call it the, the sex drive, the urge to merge. You know, it happens when you're about 12, I think, 13. It happened to me about that time. I've got an urge to merge. Nothing to do with getting married soon. <laughs> I've got an urge to merge with God, to know that intimacy with Jesus. And that's where it all starts, is hunger. You know, one of the things I've found about when you start being hungry for God, there's a humility that comes. Yeah. Uh, I've lived long enough to, to, to mix in Christian circles to see how the Christians do it, how the professional Christians do it. But I've witnessed things this year that has warmed my heart. I've seen professional pastors, guys that used to be bank managers and things like that, heavy duty, respectable people. And I've been in prayer meetings at Truro where well, these heavies, if you like, they're not doing their normal professional thing. They're down on their knees and they're crying out to God, send revival, send revival. Guys like Matt Noble and Richard Curno, these guys, send revival. Anglican vicar, send revival. God's doing a new thing amongst us. He's humbling us. Blessed are the humble. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We've got to be poor in spirit. And that, that means being poor in spirit. So God, I need you. I need you. Why does he want to pour his spirit out so much? Why does God want to pour his spirit out? Why do we have that prayer meeting just now? Suddenly get to the fire of Jesus in our bones. Why? Very simply because God so loved the world. The reason why he's wanting world revival, he wants to pour out this love. And love creates a family. God creates a kingdom of heaven where people are loving each other. And I believe that God, the reason why he's wanting to pour his spirit out on us for revival, it's not so just so that we see the... The, 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 the prophecies or the healings or the, the wonderful acts of miracles, that's part of it. But the main reason why he wants is because God is love, he wants to produce love amongst us. Yeah. And that's what he's doing. Yeah. That's why Tima said, I'm going to be preaching on the family, on love. He wants a church, an engine house, full of love for one another. Yeah. Help it, Lord. Help. <laughs> and I look forward to the time when where people just phone each other up. They just want to phone you to see how you're doing. I've been praying for you. I look forward to the time where people in the engine have, it's probably already happening, they just call on each other. I was just thinking about you. I thought I'd just call on you and just pray for you. Wouldn't it be great in the engine house if we had prayer triplets where people just find a couple of other friends and say, can I meet every week just to pray with you guys? Wouldn't that be powerful? Wouldn't that create a lot of love between us? Paul had a great insight into God. 
Paul writes a beautiful, beautiful phrase. It's a lovely phrase. We read it. Let me read it to you. It's beautiful. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with, with genuine affection. And take delight in honouring each other. It says, God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This beautiful stuff. You know, the, more, the reason why I, I, I pray hard is that I want to love hard. And I just want to love everybody. And the problem is, is I don't. Honestly, I don't. Remember, in, in, I want to. Some people I don't love. But I want to. Remember being in India and there were people... Uh, uh, Bangladesh, I think it was, and people were all queuing up to be prayed for. Uh, it was great because it was a stomach problem or a head problem or a knee problem or a, or a hip problem. I'm just saying, Jesus, heal it in the name of Jesus, be healed. Next one, please. In the name of Jesus, be healed. In the name of Jesus, and you've got a whole queue of people, you know. The next guy comes, I look around, look at, look at him. Uh, he's got half a face. He's got half a face. I don't know if he fell in the fire. I mean, it just looked something out of Hollywood, a Hollywood horror film. And I just gasped, and, I, and all my love went out the window, and all my, all my, all, all my faithful healing went out the window, and I was just got this guy with half a face looking at me. And I said, God, help me. Help me, Lord. And, and, and I, I just <coughs> hugged him. I just hugged him, and he hung on for ages. I don't know if anybody had ever hugged him in his life before. And I cried and he cried. God, give me that type of love. Yeah. You know, I want to see somebody, if somebody gets an idea to do this, please do it, please do it. I want to see somebody who will bring their camera to church and take a picture of every person. Because I want to see the photographs of people all around the prayer room so I can lay hands on you and pray you. And that, then I'll know what, who your name is. See, God does not want a, a kind of cinema type church. He wants a church that really loves one another. You know, when you go on mission together, that's when you really love each other. That's what God's wanting to do. He wants a holy church. He wants a humble church. He wants a hungry church. But he also wants a church who has higher thinking. What do I mean by higher thinking? In the Bible it says, in Ephesians, it says that we're seated in, in heavenly places. Now, what, what does that mean? That, uh, you know, you get that picture of those guys up on the skyscrapers that used to work on the skyscrapers. Have you seen those pictures of those guys way up on the skyscraper? No. They're sitting on a good, kind of good, aren't they? Eating the sandwiches. That's kind of a, a visual picture. What does it mean that we're seated in higher places? It means that even though we're living down on this planet, <coughs> God wants our spirits to be up there in heaven. He wants us to have the authority that he's got. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. A beautiful verse. Let me just read this. Another one. It's an Old Testament I came across. Let me just read this. By my power, I will make my people strong. And by my authority, they will go wherever they wish. Isn't that beautiful? That's Zechariah 10, verse 12. By my power, I will make my people strong. By my authority, they will go wherever they wish. There's a new type of Christian that's been, that's been created in the prayer room. And that's a Christian that is aware of their own weakness, but also aware of God's strength. <laughs> And I spend all my time, I have to be honest and real with you, I do not feel a great Christian. I really don't. People think they, they, they you know, they, they think it's like this guy carried a cross and all the rest of it. You know, when I pick up the cross, I'm saying, God, it's got to be you doing it. I want the cross not to be on my shoulders, but in my heart. Do you understand what I mean by that? 
I want to be a nobody. I want to be crucified with Christ so that I no longer live, but he lives. Do you understand that? But what I found is that I go with weakness and normalness, but then God starts doing things. God starts taking over. It, let me just read another, another beautiful verse to you. This is, this is, this is Paul. He, 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 he had learned that it wasn't his strength. He says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he would empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Isn't that great? It's his spirit that does it. I, I've actually got Jesus living in my heart. I don't always feel it, what I have. And the Bible says it's the same power that rose Jesus from the dead that lives in me. You know, that song that we sing comes from the Bible. And Jesus lives in my heart, and I have to trust that when God sends me out, to share Jesus, that he is going to start sharing Jesus. It's his authority that we're working with. I got a mate called John Preston, a great guy. Uh, he's a Baptist pastor. He was driving through the streets of Soho and he crashed into this sort of car. Uh, and he thought he was a Baptist pastor, he better stop. You know. <laughs> so he stops and he gets out of his car and... Uh, and the people that were in the car that he crashed in, so they got out as well. And the only trouble was they were about six foot five tall. They were all dressed in black with dark glasses. And they stood round him. They were, they were kind of security guys for some gangland guy. And he looks at them and he, and he thinks, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to get beaten up. But then he thinks about what is within his heart. Who is it that lives in his heart? So he says to these guys, guys, do you realise who I am? They start looking at each other, thinking, was he from something? And he said, well, let me just put it another way. Do you realise who I work for? No, no, we get a bit worried now. This is gangland. Then he says, I work for the highest authority in the land. I work for Jesus Christ. And as he says Jesus Christ, they kind of step back a bit like when they went to arrest Jesus and he said, I am he, and, and the, the guards stepped by. There's a power in the name yeah, of yeah, Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they said, we're so sorry. <coughs> we are so sorry. They said, look, can, can we come and introduce us to, to our boss? And they took him downstairs to meet one of these gangland bosses. And, and he started a, a ministry talking with gangland bosses. You know, they don't trust each other. They can't show any weakness. But they could show weakness to this Baptist pastor. And you see, John realised he was seated in heavenly places. And he realised the authority that is within him. He didn't feel it. But God showed him the authority. And you have that authority in you. You know, when people come for prayer... Uh, they want to be healed. I always try to look around for Seba or somebody. He's, he's more, more, more anointed than I am. Come, come and help me. I, I can't pray for, for these guys. Andrew Giddings, he's more anointed than me. I'm always thinking, you know, another guy's more anointed, you know. It's Jesus that lives inside you. It's he that does the miracles. Hallelujah. You know, I, I used to hide behind great Christians. There was a great Christian I used to work with called Dougie Wilson, Scotsman. And he, used to have, he had a great testimony. He was, he was a dope smoking guy running around away from the police. And uh, he, was, he was in Holland. And, it, and he got picked up by a, a mercenary soldier who had become a Christian. The mercenary soldier witnessed to him and, uh, and then dropped him off. And, and Doug, he dropped down on his knees and said, Jesus, I need you in my life. He, you know, and he went, went into the drugs cafe, started skinning up for his dope. Uh, and suddenly God revealed the darkness that he was in. Uh, uh, what a great testimony. He was changed. I used to hide behind. I'd go on the streets with old Dougie. I like that because I could hide behind his great testimony. I got used to his testimony. My testimony, I became a Christian when I was six. It's hardly a great story, is it? So I, I used to hide behind this guy thinking, oh, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go to the pubs together. And uh, I'd go to a pub just in the Stockwell tube station where that guy was, was shot by the security staff, remember? 
they got the wrong guy. He was a, he was a Brazilian or something like that. You know, this stalker in London. And we were going to go to this pub, and my mate phoned up and he said, I'm really sorry, pal. I can't, I can't come today. I'm going to a prayer meeting. I thought, oh, no, alone again. Alone again. I've, uh, you know, I spent most of my life as an evangelist alone. It's good because I have to trust in Jesus instead of trusting people. So I go to this pub and you can see I'm a pretty skinny guy. I haven't got any, haven't got any matching us to, to be able to sort of, you know, act as if I'm a hard man. I walk in the pub and everybody looks at you. You know that feeling where everybody looks at you? I feel two inches tall. I go to the bar and, uh, and I order a Coke. That's even worse. They all look at me. And I stand there sipping my Coke. And I, I spend most of my life not feeling Holy Spirit. But sometimes when I do feel the Holy Spirit, I love it. I love the Lord. So I'm, I'm there drinking my Coke and I, I'm starting to praise God. I say, God, you're wonderful. God, you live in that high and holy place. Oh, God, I'm starting to get standing by the bar and I'm praising God. I say, God, you're great. You're, you love everybody in this bar. Lord God, come on, Lord Jesus, come on. And then this bloke next to me talks to me. And he's a big fella. He's got a tattoo of an eagle on his neck. And he says, yeah, where are you from? Man? What are you doing here? They talk like that, tough guys. <laughs> <coughs> Got a name on it, a Twix. <laughs> so I said, I'm from Mitchum. He says, Mitchum? That's only five miles down the road. He says, it's hundreds of miles away. What brings you here? And what had brought me there? God had brought me there. So I said, and with a breath, I sort of said, I said, God. He said, what? I said, God. And he says, which God? Now, at that moment, at that moment, the Holy Spirit came on me. I had a mighty mouse experience. I swelled up. I don't know why I said this. I never say this in my life. I don't say this. I said, the God, the God of Israel. I don't know why I said that. The keys would be really bad. And he says, I'm going to stop you there, boy, because I'm a naughty man. You know what I mean by that? I've, been, I've done time. I've, people know me around here. And he said, uh, you better not laugh at what I say now, but the other day I had a row with my girlfriend. And uh, I came to the pub here and I, and, I, and I said, God, what's it all about? What's it all about? And I put my hands up like that. And at that moment, he says, you better not laugh at me. And I said, I'm not laughing, mate, honestly. At that moment, he said, I had this experience. I felt the presence of God. I don't understand it, but I did. I got on the phone to the local vicar and I said, Vicar, I'm not drunk, I'm not stoned, but I think I've met God. He says, I'll be going for lessons. I'll be going for lessons with the vicar to, to learn how to follow Jesus. And, 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 and my girlfriend, she, she, she's changed as well. And she's going for lessons. And, and my brother went up, came up to me the other day and he said, do you want to do a job? Criminal job. He says, no, mate, I've changed, I've changed. Then he turned to me and he said, is that what you're talking about? And I said, that's exactly what I'm talking about. You see what I'm saying about the authority of Jesus? And he says, all these pamphlets on the, on the table, my, my testimony pamphlet. And he says, what are these then? I said, that's my story about let Jesus. Well, what are they doing on the, on, on, on the table? Like, Come on, let's give them out. Come on, let's give them out. <laughs> and he gives them all around the pub and nobody says no. because <laughs> Well, I love telling that story, but why am I telling it? Because it's the same Jesus that lives in me. You know, it's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. I carry Jesus, but you carry Jesus. And he's saying, will you spend this time of hunger? Will you spend it in your personal life? Will you come into the prayer? Would you get souped up on catching my heart? And I will humble you, because it's only God that can bring revival, not us. Yeah. Keep going, keep going, like Simeon and Anna, keep going. Yeah. They kept on going year after year, because it's going to surely come. Yeah. The Holy Spirit's going to be upon that poor. And he is great, like that, almost like a rap song. I heard the voice of a prophet of our time. He said, there's revival, if you want to receive it. And you'll see the people of God display God's power. Can't you believe it? Won't you receive it? There's going to be peace and happiness 
place of love for everyone. And we'll be one great big family. I'm going to finish with a Bible verse. Beautiful Bible verse. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. That's God. He's the one that does the miracles. He's the one that takes over. He's the one that wants to use each one of us. You know, one day I'm going to be standing here and many of you would have gone on mission somewhere. Yeah? And then God's trying to get us souped up, prepared for the outpouring of God's Spirit. I will build my church, says God. I will build my church. And the gates of hell won't be able to stand against it. And that's us, folks. Us simple people. Come on, Tima. Come on, boy. Jesus. <coughs> Come on then, let's respond. Let's all just stand. Let's the worship team back out, please. There's a dance that's in your chair. You've given us the bed. Now we're stirring up the head.